the Knights of Columbus Video Library contains programs that can be used for training, membership recruitment, or promoting the good of the order. These videos are excellent for use at council meetings, open houses, or as general information about the Knights of Columbus and its history. A complete listing of videos available is found in the audiovisual flyer or by contacting the Supreme Council Department of Fraternal Services. Knights of Columbus Videos, programs that educate, recruit, and inspire. In the very heart of Rome, near the banks of the Tiber River, stands this majestic building, a tangible tribute to the enduring strength of Christian belief. This is St. Peter's Basilica, the seat of the Pope and the central shrine of the Christian world. The Basilica is on a site that has been hallowed by its sacred function for almost 2,000 years. The site's earlier history is quite the opposite. The Emperor Caligula once built a Roman circus and stadium here, and Nero staged the spectacles for which he is infamous. It became his place for martyring Christians. Among them, Peter the Fisherman, the loyal companion of Christ who would be known to the world as Saint Peter, Prince of the Apostles. Peter was crucified here, head down on an inverted cross, and was buried only a few yards from where he died. A site that was immediately transformed by the Christian community from one of pagan cruelty to a place of prayer and worship, a shrine to St. Peter. The original St. Peter's Basilica was begun by the Christianized Emperor Constantine some 250 years after St. Peter's death to formalize the site's sacred nature. Completed in 345 A.D. by his son Constantius, the Basilica stood here for 1,200 years, all the time growing as a repository for the sacred and beautiful symbols of the growth of Western Christendom. But by 1450, faced with the irreversible decay of the structure, Pope Nicholas V launched plans to level the old Basilica and build a new one. What resulted was the basilica we know today. The structure was dedicated by Pope Urban VIII in 1626, after 176 years of continuous construction. Its high altar is directly over the place Peter the Fisherman was buried so many years ago. The basilica's dome, soaring more than 400 feet over the worshippers below, is an architectural tour de force by the great sculptor and painter, Michelangelo. More than 50,000 people can be accommodated during services with open aisles and no crowding. Outside its peaceful confines, Rome bustles with activity and the Tiber River flows peacefully on its journey to the Tyrrhenian Sea on Italy's west coast. One of the Tiber's tributaries, the Anion River, joins it near Tivoli, just outside of Rome. Through the seasons and the centuries, the Anion is flooded and receded in this area of Tivoli countless times, constantly adding small deposits to the limestone-like stone along its banks. The stone is called Travertine, an old Roman word for the Tivoli region. Being relatively easy to cut, even with the crude tools available in ancient times, the travertine has always been highly prized by architects and artists, for it allows them a creative freedom that has made the area the home of some of the most graceful architecture and statuary in the world. The magnificent facade of St. Peter's was built largely of the local travertine stone to plans drawn by one of that era's great architects, Carlos Moderno. The roads to Rome were deep with ruts from the quarry wagons by the time the facade was completed 
1614. Today, visiting pilgrims are welcome to the vastness of St. Peter's Square, one of the world's greatest public spaces, by the 34-foot-tall statues of St. Peter on the left, St. Paul on the right, and the massive statues atop the facade representing the Savior, St. John the Baptist, and the 11 apostles. The statues are flanked at either end by two clocks. One, the Ultramontano, or Beyond the Mountain Clock, conforms with the digital watches of today's pilgrims. The other, the Alitaliana, still tells the time of the primitive church, counting the day from sunset to sunset. To the casual visitor, the structure appears to be a never-changing reminder of the past. But a closer look reveals faults, some centuries in the making, that threaten the facade and its statuary. And if not corrected, the pilgrims below. For the very properties that make its travertine stone pliable in the hands of man also allow the forces of nature to alter the artistry. For more than three and a half centuries, wind, rain, and sun have caressed its graceful curves, adding a rich patina to its surface, but at the same time, steadily and relentlessly eroding the stone. In more recent years, the mixed blessing of the internal combustion engine and its haze of fouling airborne chemicals has greatly hastened the process. The cracks in the facade itself had filled with soil swirling in the air around the basilica, offering a home to a wide variety of tenacious shrubs and plants, including fig trees of various sizes. The exploring roots probed the travertine in search of anchorage and support gradually prying the blocks apart. The reverently carved statues were literally crumbling. The rust-stained likeness of St. John the Baptist offers graphic evidence of the onslaught. St. James the Greater fared no better. The hand of the statue was fractured by distortion of the iron clamps. Some of the early patchwork was done with black cement the best available material at the time, but no contribution to renewed beauty. The 20-foot-high statue of the Savior, the centerpiece of Moderno's design, could hardly support the copper-covered wood cross placed in its arms three and a half centuries earlier. The cross itself was badly disintegrated. The beautiful edifice was in trouble. Intermittent repairs to areas in need of such attention had been accomplished through the centuries but never had there been a full-scale program focusing on the entire facade. Now, however, such a project was mandatory. The Reverenda Fabrica di San Pietro, the commission for the maintenance of St. Peter's Basilica, was the agency charged with the responsibility of preserving Vatican treasures, as it has been since the beginning. Archbishop Lino Zanini was the administrator of the commission. It was he who discussed the undertaking with Count Enrico Galeazzi, the Knights of Columbus representative at the Vatican for more than a half a century and an honorary member of the board of directors of the Knights of Columbus. Galeazzi was also the chief lay architect for the buildings in Vatican City. He knew well the pressing need for the extensive renovations the archbishop had laid before him. After consultations with Count Galeazzi, the Archbishop turned to the Supreme Headquarters of the Knights of Columbus in New Haven, Connecticut. The response was immediate and positive. Supreme Knight Virgil C. Deccant had this to say about the undertaking. Our one and a half million members, plus our families, were deeply honored to participate in this initiative, realizing the tremendous love pilgrims from all over the world share for this spiritual haven and architectural masterpiece. We saw this as a tremendous opportunity to exemplify our loyalty and devotion to the Church and to our Holy Father, to its bishops and priests. What better example of our Order's dedication to the Church could there be than to answer her call 
to make this restoration possible. The Knight's offer to finance the project was far more than mere lip service. It was a deep commitment to one of the most famous sites in Christendom. The facade is larger than a football field, 165 feet high, stretching 350 feet across St. Peter's Square. Its eight principal columns, all of which needed work, are nine feet in diameter and 90 feet in height. The thickness of the wall itself averages 16 feet. When the surface of all the intricate architectural extensions have been added to the overall facade dimensions, the area to be renovated totaled a staggering 113,000 square feet, or almost three acres. Nearly two years and 80,000 man hours would be needed for the process. Work began in the spring of 1985. A team of 70 persons was assembled, architects and designers, carpenters and plumbers, bricklayers and painters, mosaic specialists and stonemasons, all had a place in the awesome but delicate task. The goal was to restore the facade, not make it like new. Methods such as sandblasting would destroy the precious patina bestowed by the passing years, so the travertine stone had to be painstakingly hand cleaned. Where the travertine was damaged, it was replaced by new stone from the same local quarries that had originally been used. The project was divided into seven phases, so the front of the basilica would never be totally hidden by the necessary protective screens and scaffolding. And so the work began. Some parts of the facade, such as this three-ton tiara atop the Ultramontano clock, were literally dismantled, restored, and then reassembled using state-of-the-art support material and engineering systems. The clocks themselves were meticulously cleaned and damaged mosaic tile pieces were replaced. The tile experts also restored the 78 three-foot high letters of the inscription across the front of the building, which reads, In honor of the Prince of the Apostles, Paul V, a Roman of the Borghese family, Supreme Pontiff, in the year 1612, the seventh year of his pontificate. Restoring the statues across the top of the basilica was one of the largest challenges faced by the restoration team. They had been badly damaged by both nature and unwittingly by man. The gates guarding the five entrances to the basilica had received no real attention since the early 1800s except for an occasional painting with black enamel, which obscured the artistic bronze and brass ornamentation. One of the few artifacts that resisted restoration efforts was the cross held by the statue of Christ for the past 350 years. It had originally been made of wood, covered with copper sheets. The copper acted like a furnace, baking and destroying the wood, leaving only the copper shell the decision was made to replace the cross. His Holiness, Pope John Paul II, made a gift of the historic cross to the Knights of Columbus as a gesture of appreciation for their financial support of the facade project. Today it is displayed, protected from the elements, in the Knights New Haven headquarters. We were gratified and honored more than we can say by the gift made to the Knights of Columbus by His Holiness of the majestic cross which was held by the statue of Christ the Redeemer at the summit of the Basilica for 373 years. The privilege of safeguarding this precious treasure over the centuries yet to come will remind us, the Knights of today, that we played an important part in this monumental work of preserving the facade of St. Peter's for generations to come. The two large statues in front of the basilica representing St. Peter and St. Paul were also in an advanced stage of decay, but here space age solutions were sought. After a thorough cleaning, the two marble statues were coated with ethyl silicone to reinforce the marble. Epoxy resin was injected into cracks that had developed over the 150 years the statues had been standing. The result? allows us to see them as their creator had. The progress of the work was eagerly followed by the Knights. 
Archbishop Zanini and Count Galeazzi. When the last piece of scaffolding was finally removed after almost two years of exacting labor, St. Peter's Basilica was seen as no one of this century had ever seen it before. Today, once again, this tomb of saints, seat of popes, treasury of art and sculpture, and marvel of architecture rises preeminent above all other churches in the Christian world. High above St. Peter's Square is a new addition to the facade, this plaque, which reads, Pope John Paul II, wishing to honor the Prince of Apostles, restored to its former glory the facade of the Patriarchal Vatican Basilica through the munificent generosity of the Order of the Knights of Columbus. The project had been followed closely by the Holy Father. From his study, he could hear the San Pietrini, the team of craftsmen who performed the work and follow their progress as they carefully readjusted the abuses of nature. At the conclusion of the work, the Holy Father granted a special audience to the knights and their families, as well as the architects and the San Pietrini. This bronze model of the facade was presented to His Holiness at the audience. The Holy Father, for his part, left no doubt about his feelings regarding the knights. I would like to add in the English language a special word of greeting to the Supreme Knight, Mr. Virgil de Kant, and to the other knights of Columbus and their families who are present today. For more than a hundred years, the Knights of Columbus have distinguished themselves by their love for Christ and loyalty to the Church, by their service to the poor and needy, by their defense of the handicapped, and unborn, and by their strong support of family life. You stand forth as a shining example of the role of the laity in the life and mission of the Church. The financing of the repair and maintenance, maintenance of the facade of St. Peter's Basilica and the colossal statues above is yet one more symbol of the dedicated spirit of your esteemed organization and of your devotion and fidelity to the success of St. Peter. My heart is full of gratitude to all of you for this latest project and for all you do in the service of Christ and the Gospel. May our loving Redeemer bless you and your families with his abundant grace and peace. Thank you very much. His Holiness then greeted each of the Knights members and families in a manner that made each feel a special part of the restoration work. For they had witnessed firsthand the transformation of the structure and had watched other pilgrims admiring its renewed majesty. It was indeed a proud day for the order. A special bond between the Vatican and the Knights of Columbus has existed since the founding of the order more than a century ago. The Knights' contribution in restoring this symbol of Christianity, now approaching its fourth century, has strengthened and deepened that union.